right, we here now. Episode 9 of the 10 part series of The Last Dance. The Chicago Bulls rolled to their second three peat in eight years. Hey, I'm Modi J. I'm going to do things a little bit different. I'm going to drop episode 9 and 10, both of them today. It's the finale weekend. I'm not going to have you guys waiting two days to see episode 9 and episode 10. So we're going to get both of them today. Hey, if you know me, I'm not going to hold you up. But if you like my content, Please subscribe to the channel if you're new. And if you're a returning watcher, click that notification bell. Hey, and get something every time I upload. Let's jump right into it. This is episode nine. So starting off the episode, they take us back to 93 to start the show with the rivalry that came between Reggie Miller and Michael Jordan, the Pacers versus the Bulls, which led all the way up to you know, 98 when they had their big playoff game where they went to game seven. So it takes it back. Reggie and MJ, they've been going at it with each other. MJ came in 84, Reggie came in in 87, and they just were going at it. I mean, it's basketball. So when you have two good players going at it on the court, you you really never know what to expect, but you know both sides are gonna give their best. So this this became like a pretty much an issue between the two, because they both want the same thing. They both want to win. That's what it boils down to. They both want to win. And they just collide the whole time that they on the court. And this is the little infamous scuffle that they had in 93. It was one punch thrown by MJ. He got one off. But, you know, for the most part, they were all tied up. They showed MJ reacting to it. And he's talking about, hey, let him go. I mean, I'm pretty sure he would have gave Reggie Miller the business. Because Reggie is a skinny guy back then. But Reggie and MJ, they're cool. And he was just saying they had a unique relationship with each other. That's just how they were on the court. They both respected each other. But when they were on that court, they were enemies. Then they go into Reggie Miller. They pretty much interview him. He's saying one day he was trash talking Jordan while they were playing. This is in the game. He was going off. He was doing good in the first in the first half, he said. He was scoring. MJ wasn't doing too good. He maybe had like two or four points or something. But then at halftime, MJ came out and was a total monster. Talking about he destroyed them. And at the end of that game, he told him that Michael Jordan walked up to him and told him, hey, don't ever trash talk black Jesus. And from that day, Reggie Miller never called on Michael Jordan no more. It was either Jordan, black Jesus, or that black cat. He, <laughs> Reggie said he didn't fear MJ at all, but you had to respect that man on the court. And like MJ told him, that's not the guy you want to talk trash to, especially with MJ being in his own. It's going to be ugly for you. And to that day, hey, Black Jesus was born, at least in Reggie Miller's eyes. Like I said, man, it, this rivalry was very big. If you if you were around in the 90s to watch it, then you know exactly what I mean. So MJ just going off, game one, boom, they in Chicago, he doing his thing, got the reverse layup, and one. MJ's doing his thing. Black Jesus, that's what they were calling him, Black Jesus on the court. He walks on water. But he goes off. They dismantled him. And the Pacers really don't, they're like, we knew that they were good, but we feel like we have a better team. So this really caught them off guard, and they needed to come up with a game plan because game one, Bulls, what you, what you going to do now? You're down, and they're at home. So they're expected to win the home game. What can you do to stop this, though? Like I was saying, they win the first two games. They're in Chicago. This is expected from, you know, they were coming back two-time finals MVPs, they're coming back. MJ, he's expected to win at home. Like this Chicago Bulls, this this United Center, this is home. This this is our ground. We gotta protect it. But game three was on the road. Now that's a different story. Even Phil Jackson said going out there to Indiana is crazy. They were throwing parades before game three. People in the streets everywhere yelling, Bulls are going down, all kinds of stuff because they felt that they really had a better team than the Bulls. Now maybe they had more depth. But name-wise, they weren't better than the Bulls. Nobody really was better than the Bulls. But when you get in here, it's electrifying. Everyone's yelling. All of the fans going crazy inside of here. They all love these Pacers. So game three started off kind of rough for the Pacers. They were they were into it. But, you know, Reggie wasn't really on yet. Now, we all know Reggie was the Curry before Curry. I won't say he had the most, like, best moves. But he was shooting that thing from anywhere. And it was if Reggie got hot, we know he's on fire. Like, NBA Jam was out around here. So, he's on fire is what they did not want from Reggie Miller. 
MJ's doing his thing. Reggie starts to come too. Reggie starts picking up his game. Boom, boom, boom. Now it comes down to the final seconds of the game. Now, the thing about this, there was two plays. There was a Pacers play. There was a Bulls play. Like I said, there was two plays. The Reggie Miller push off on MJ where he hits the big time three to go up by two. He knew that they were going to double team. So what Reggie Miller did when they did the pick and roll, well, it wasn't a pick and roll. When they set a pick on Reggie, he ran straight to MJ and gave him a push off to create space. They inbound the ball to Reggie. Reggie hits the big three. They pan over to Larry Bird. Larry Bird is their coach, and he's not impressed at all. Because why? The Chicago Bulls have a player named Michael Jordan on their team. And Larry Bird has played against them, so he knows that, hey, this game isn't over. It's .7 seconds left. That's more than enough time for MJ to get the ball and shoot. As you can see here, they inbound the ball to MJ. MJ double clutch, puts it up. Everyone thought it was going in it. It goes in. Reggie Miller's up under. He looks up. He said millimeter, a millimeter. It rims in and out. If MJ hits that, they go up 3-0. The Pacers win this one. Reggie Miller pulled one out. Reggie Miller really pulled one out. In 1997, the Bulls advanced to their fifth finals in seven years with a 69-win regular season. Their opponent was the Utah Jazz, who were making their first NBA Finals appearance. Remember, they went back to back against the Bulls. Now, they ended up beating the Houston Rockets in game six. John Stockton ended up hitting the big open three, taking them head to advance to their first finals. Now, going into this, MJ, they, they had already, you know, saying they played against Utah and it was, you know, they had their little, it wasn't a rivalry at this point because this is their first time meeting up in the finals, but you know, you got John Stockton, Carl Malone over there. So they had a pretty good team. The thing that filled MJ the most for this finals matchup is Carl Malone won MVP. So we already know, like in all the other episodes, to MJ, someone else winning a, a regular season MVP. I may have said finals earlier, but I re meant regular season. Anyone else winning an award that he thought he should have got, that right there instantly, boom, boom, boom. He was a fire in his head, and he can't let that down. So he said, oh, y'all think Carl Malone's MVP? All right, I'm going to show you who's the MVP. So during this matchup, MJ talks about when he was playing baseball. So like I said, he's cool. He knows Carl Malone, John Stockton, the NBA. They all know each other. So they're all cordial unless they really have, like, an off-court altercation. But so while he's playing baseball um, in Chicago, the Chicago Bulls are playing Utah. And Brian Russell, we know he guarded MJ in the finals. He finally gets to meet, you know, MJ. And he's telling him, oh, man, why'd you retire, man, before I got a chance to play? You know I could hold you. And MJ is looking at him like, who is this dude? Hey, Carl Malone, talk to your, your boy. Tell this kid, hey, he doesn't want no problems with me. So that right there on top of Carl Malone winning MVP, that's just too much fire that you give MJ to play with. So for MJ, it's like, I'm going to teach this kid something. And what he did was go out there and teach that kid something. <laughs> Russell didn't want no parts of MJ out there. So we fast forward to game five, the infamous flu game. Jordan actually gives us a, a whole story of what actually happened. Everyone's saying it's flu-like symptoms. No one really knows what's wrong with MJ. But the night before game five, they were up. It's about 1030. He's hungry. So he tells his assistant and his agent, like, hey, man, I'm hungry. Let's get some food. So... They call around, they're looking everywhere to try to find some food. Nothing is open. They find one pizza spot. They end up ordering a pizza. They said when the pizza got there, there was five guys to, to deliver one pizza. Now, me personally, I've never known more than one person to show up to deliver your pizza. But maybe because it's Jordan, they're like, all right, let's make sure nothing happens to this pizza. You know what I'm saying? So they deliver it to the house. I mean, to the Marriott Hotel. His agent's saying they're trying to look in because they know that this is for MJ. But he said, man, something strange about this. Nobody ate any of the pizza except for Michael Jordan. After he ate the pizza around 2.30 in the morning, 3 o'clock, he's waking up. And he's sick. He can't keep anything down. And he's calling his agent. And they're like, hey, this is bad. Like, So MJ said it wasn't flu. It wasn't the flu. It was food poisoning. 
And he said the next day leading up to the game, he just stayed in bed all day. He couldn't hold any fluids down. He had an IV. But his mom called him. He told his mom, hey, I have to play this game. I have to at least try. He also told Phil Jackson, hey, I can be a decoy, but I got to play this game. It's game five. I can't let the team down. Now, that's a different type of determination right there. Even with everything going on, MJ was still determined to play, man. This guy's a true fighter, man. He's never going to give up on his team. He's going to do whatever it takes for his team to win. Like I said, man, he couldn't hold anything down, so he has an eight all day. Very, very minimum fluids besides the IV. He gets out there. At the beginning of the game, you're thinking, oh, brother, this guy stinks. This ain't the MJ. We know. It's like someone took his powers. He's out there airballing, missing easy layups, but he starts to get to it. Once they start calling timeouts, they're looking at MJ and it's like, <sighs> like all the energy he has is leaving his body when those timeouts come. He gets a chance to rest, he's trying to take a little bit of water, you know what I'm saying? Got to stay hydrated as much as he can, whatever he can hold down. But they said as soon as a timeout was called, you would look at him and it's just like, damn, how is he going, man? It comes down to a free throw. MJ misses a free throw late, late in the game, about 45 seconds left. He grabs the ball. They set up the offense past the Pippen. They double team Pippen, which I don't know why. It's like, hey, you gotta let Pippen take that fade away. If he makes it, he makes it. If not, they we in here. They double team Pippen. Pippen kicks it back. MJ hits a big three. 38 points in 44 minutes with food poisoning. MJ is just another animal, man. Like, <laughs> there's no denying his great. Now they give us the backstory of Steve Kerr. Now, I thought they would give us Steve Kerr's background, probably like episode four, you know, MJ, then Pippen, then Rodman, then it would have been Kerr, but they made us wait to episode nine. So the thing about Kerr is he was young. He had some siblings. It was his mother and his father. Both of them were professors. So for him, playing sports was just something fun he loved to do. His dad was a professor at UCLA. So he got to go to all the UCLA, uh, UCLA games. You know what I'm saying? Bill Walton was playing at that time. So he got to see all that for that. For him to see that at a young age, he's like, hey, sports, that's what I want to do. And his dad supported him playing sports. Now, he said they weren't allowed to watch TV Monday through Thursday unless it was a big game going on, which his dad, you know, would help him out. Steve Kerr, he talked about him um, playing basketball. He didn't get any recruiter, any recruitment pretty much when he was in high school. He said it was about as much as the girls that um, attention he was getting from them zero so he got an offer from arizona this is the last minute thing to play basketball he never visited the campus but he was just so happy a college offered him something and he went with it i probably would have did a thing too especially if a big university like arizona university or something like hey hey i'll make it you know what I'm saying james harden went to asu so but so he went out there his dad became a president of a school in Baru. it's a middle eastern school he became the president of that. He ended up getting killed. He was shot by two armed assailants who portrayed as students. So that was tough on Kerr while he was in college that his father died. Kerr, he knew he wasn't that good of a player. So when he came to the Bulls, he had to be up under the wings of John Paxson. That's who he learned from. So Steve Kerr, he got drafted by the Suns, played a year there, then he went to Cleveland. And what he would do is, while he was in Cleveland, he watched John Paxson because that's where he wanted to be. He was like, I got to be on this Bulls team. I got to go play with them. So he would study him, and they played him a lot because, you know, they're both in the Eastern Conference. And once he ended up getting onto the Bulls, John Paxson pretty much took him up under his wing. Like, hey, it's 93. Come up under me, you know what I'm saying, and learn the game. I'm going to tell you what Jordan wants from you. This is what... I do, this is how you're gonna do this, you're gonna execute. Because John Paxson, he even said it himself, he knew early in his career, he was just a role player. But you gotta play your role the best that you can. If everyone does their job, then we're good. You do your job, I do my job, we bring them together, job complete. So he pretty much tells Steve Kerr like, hey, MJ has to trust you. When you're on that court, he has to know he can look at you and depend on you to do what you need to do. And from that moment, Kerr just knew, hey, I got to do whatever I can to make sure that the team is good. And it turned out pretty good for Kerr. So the thing about Kerr that's funny, so the story is, if you remember, Kerr hit a big shot. 
he hit a big time mid-range jumper. So before the play has started, MJ's on the sideline with Curry. He knows that, you know, the stars always had a camera on you. No matter where you're at, camera, camera, camera. So they looking at MJ the whole time. MJ's covering his face like, hey, Kerr, they're going to double team me. Be ready. Steve Kerr, he doesn't know nothing about this. So he's just like, hey, okay, I'll be ready, man. Trust me, I'll be ready. Pretty much telling MJ, I'm going to prove myself. So just like MJ said, MJ gets the ball. They double team. He kicks it out to Kerr. Kerr hits the big shot. Now, what Kerr said in his speech when they won their fifth title, uh, yeah, well, whew, we're on the sideline and they call a play for Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan looks at Phil Jackson and tells Phil, I don't feel comfortable in this situation. We need to go a different route. And they're looking at MJ like, what? Steve Kerr then says, yeah, I think we need to go to Steve for this shot. I'm sure he can handle this. And sure enough, Steve Kerr makes it and he bails MJ out. That's Steve Kerr's story and he's sticking with it. So everyone's laughing because they just knew it was just Steve Kerr. They're all having fun. They're celebrating their fifth ring. Like you got to have fun. You got to enjoy it. So Gus let, um, he was Jordan's security. He started off as a police officer. He worked his way up to sergeant. Then he became security at the, the United Center. And then he started doing personal security strictly for MJ. You know MJ's father had passed. So after MJ's father passed, he started looking at Gus more of like the father figure. Gus was always around MJ. If MJ would call in the middle of the night and needed something, Gus would get up and go see him. So for that, MJ really treated him like a father figure. He would do anything for him. Gus ended up getting sick and MJ was the first person to notice it. So he calls Gus' wife and he's letting her know like, hey, you need to take Gus to the hospital. Turned out he had lung cancer. So even during all this, the chemo and everything, MJ's there like a son, you know, making sure the family's good. He's at the house staying over there, just making sure because Gus is the, the only father figure he has now that his dad's gone. So he has Gus everywhere he goes. The reason they got so close was when MJ first broke his leg, uh, not his leg, his ankle, Gus was there. He was making sure MJ got to his car. So that they just built this bond over years, you know, they've been together for 10 years. It's like, hey, it's always good to have somebody like that for you. Fast forward to game seven, uh, the Eastern Conference Finals in 98. They're going at it. Bulls, Pacers, they're going at it. I mean, this is nonstop. Score staying close. <sighs> going into the fourth quarter with 69-69, like, it's just intense out here, man. It could go either way. Reggie Miller said it best. In the game seven, game plan is pretty much thrown out the window. Who wants it more? That's what it comes down to. With about six minutes left, the Pacers are up 77-74. They have a jump ball between MJ and Rick Smith. And it's pretty one-sided. You're thinking, okay, Smith is 7-4. He's going to get this jump ball. Now, they're up by three. So, with six minutes left, if they get this ball, they go down and score, go up five. It's pretty much momentum has shifted. You know what I'm saying? The Bulls are going to be playing catch up at this point. MJ doesn't get the jump ball, but he gets tipped to Scottie Pippen. And right then, Reggie Miller knew, hey, this might be this might be the end of it. Everyone's already thinking, hey, the Pacers got it. But once Scottie Pippen gets the ball off the tip, it, the momentum just shifts back to the Bulls. And the Bulls take off from there and... They don't look back. They go ahead and win this series in seven. And they go lay six finals appearance in eight years. The good thing about that is at the end of the game, MJ went and got the game ball and gave it to Gus, his new father figure. So for Gus, that's good. You know, he went through chemo. It's kind of hard of him hearing he had cancer and everything. So for a guy that you I won't say raised because MJ was an adult when they met, but a guy that you helped mold and be there and be a part of his life and he's a part of yours, that's pretty significant right there. And that's a big moment in your life. And it's just a good thing, man. It's just a heartfelt thing from MJ. Everyone said he was mean, but I mean, he looked out for Gus, man. He looked out for the ones that he loved. Hey, that's episode nine of the 10 part series. Like I said, I'm dropping nine and 10 today. 
So, hey, comment below. Do you have anyone that's in your life that's been influential with you? And if you're a hooper, if are you like Steve Kerr? Did you have any, you know what I'm saying, any recruitment letters coming in? Me personally, I had like two, but I played football. Uh, that didn't pan out well for me. That's why I'm here on YouTube now. But just comment below. Hey, thank you for watching. This is episode nine. Like I say, man, if you're new to the channel, like my content, please subscribe and turn on your notification bell so you get something every time I upload. Hey, thanks for watching. Tune in for episode 10. I'm out. Jimmy on the beat, boy.